Right, good evening all. And on behalf of our uh, esteemed president who's currently in Yarrawonga and uh, our vice president who's um, lacking sleep but is operating back at the club rooms, um, it's my, um, my duty to present our guest speaker for this evening, Chris um, VK3, oh, gee, um, QB. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Um, so Chris is going to talk tonight on CW, um, where it is, what's it all at, where we are these days, and um, how we can um, get involved for those who might be interested. It happens to be a particular interest of mine, although I'm not very good at it, but anyway. Um, so Chris is um, very active in the CW community, in particular with um, the FISTS group and, um, and also the CW Ops, which is the American based group who um, provide a training, training sessions for those who want to firstly get involved, secondly to advance and improve with their classes. And I must say, I've, I started out with one of their classes. It was really good. So welcome, Chris. Um, great to have you along, a mem long time member of the club. And um, somebody who's going to talk with us about um, the CW uh, mode, shall I say, the, the first digital mode, Chris. So over to you. Welcome. Thanks, Dave. And thanks, everyone. Thanks, John. And thanks for inviting me along. Um, I'll start by apologising for my state. This is not sort of anything to do with lockdown. I uh, went looking for my shaver today. And <laughs> my wife has been using it to shave our dog. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, as such, I'm a little bit woolly and um, it's something that I'll be uh, looking into next week. But that's the excuse for my rather unkempt appearance this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thanks for the intro, uh, Dave. As, uh, as you said, my name's Chris Chapman, VK3QB. I'm a member of EMDRC and uh, Kippy Gate down at um, Cranbourne. Um, I'm also a member and a committee member of Fists Down Under which is the Australian chapter of the International Morse Preservation Society and a member of CW Ops. As Dave said, that's a, an American based club, but it's, it's global. It has members um, all around the world. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about those two clubs as well. Um, the other thing I'll be talking about is the incredible difference between learning Morse code today and looking around the room. I'd say we've got a few people that probably did their five words a minute or 10 words a minute 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, we'll be just talking briefly about the difference in learning techniques uh, between those agonising days of the five word a minute tapes you used to get off AR New South Wales and um, uh, what you can do these days. Um, so on that basis, I'll uh, share my screen. All right, so when John asked me to talk a little bit about Morse code, I thought I'm gonna try and make this a little bit different, um, a little bit interesting in a hope that um, if you are not into CW now and you're scratching your head, um, you might uh, you might wanna give it a go. Um, uh, hence the title, Morse code is dead, long live Morse code. Morse code was born in the 1830s. Um, Morse and Alfred Vail first developed the code in 1830. And I think about 1851, the international Morse code was ratified. And since then, uh, the code has enjoyed a fairly illustrious career, um, first over the wires. And then since about 1890 or thereabouts, uh, when Marconi started dabbling with it, with RF. And then by the time we got into the first decade of the 20th century, it was gaining acceptance. Interestingly enough, when they first started using it, they weren't considering using it um, as a broadcast mode. It was more intended as a closed circuit mode, which of course you know, doesn't really um, suit the very nature of RF. Nonetheless, throughout the 20th century, um, it was enjoyed uh, in the commercial world, the shipping world, um, of course, the military and amateur radio. In fact, amateur radio enthusiasts have been using the code uh, really since it came onto RF. And amateur radio in the probably early 1900s, 1910, 1920, certainly. And it was a very, very active mode. In fact, you know, for many years, it was the only mode and, until AM came along. 
And then finally, following the removal of Morse code from shipping primarily, we finally dropped it from the syllabus in 2004. Most other countries uh, were dropping Morse code sort of from 2000, 1999, 2000 up until I think 2004. So by the time we got to 2005, Morse code was clearly no longer a requirement, as far as I know, anywhere in the world to get an amateur radio license. And many, of course, were saying that this will be the end of Morse code. And like every other change we've had in the hobby, they said it would be the end of the hobby. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of people thinking Morse code wouldn't go anywhere. Of course, the flip side is when the code was removed from the syllabus and the requirement to, to understand and learn Morse code to get an amateur radio licence, or at least two of the three classes at the time, um, this opened the hobby up to countless people um, who hadn't joined amateur radio because of the requirement to learn Morse code. Uh, so many saw that as a very positive step forward. And of course, um, those of you that were Z calls or limited calls in the old days, got a free ticket onto the HF bands, um, which of course was a good thing because that brought more people onto the HF bands. And of course, the other thing that, that really happened in reality, Morse code didn't die. Um, if anything, it has become more active. And you know, it's that adage, uh, some things are more attractive when you don't have to do them or when you don't have to learn them. And certainly that's, uh, that's some of the, the attitudes I'm seeing when I'm out and about talking to people. Of course, the recent low sunspots we had just uh, four, five, six years ago, of course, brought a lot of people back to Morse code. Um, digital modes, of course, have also kept a lot of people in the hobby or brought them into the hobby. A lot of the, uh, the people out doing um, portable operations, including you know, parks on the air, SOTA, summits on the air, and the, um, the WWFF programs have moved over onto Morse code for the simple reason that it is a lot easier to get contacts when you're out and about, typically with low power and maybe with uh, compromised antennas. Um, so it's been fantastic to hear people like uh, Peter 3PF, um, who used not to, to practice Morse code at all and to be listening to him on the weekends um, his speed is his is coming up and his his conversational skills are, are coming up as well. And I just use Peter as one example because many of you will know him, but um, there's a quite a few extra call signs that have been popping up as a direct result of all of the portable operation. And then you've got people who have sort of, they've done a number of things in the hobby and they're saying, you know what, I haven't done Morse code or I did it 30, 40, 50 years ago and only did it to get the license. Um, I might relearn it and uh, get back on the air. And just a little anecdote, something that has always intrigued me, um, I suppose by way of background, I got my first license in 1984 as a novice. My school teacher had me write a um, logging program for the RD contest. And he asked me to be his log keeper. And I was absolutely fascinated with his FT-101E and all the knobs and dials and lights and the noises coming out of it and Morse code in particular um, attracted me. So I, I went off and started learning Morse code immediately. One of the things that happens, um, uh, some of you that know me know I like to go on day expeditions every year or two, typically Norfolk Island, Lord Howe Island or Vanuatu. We always have operators with us who are sideband operators or digital operators. But I'm always uh, very pleased and intrigued when the non-CW operators gather around the Morse code operator. Everybody wants to look over the shoulder and watch the Morse code operator in action. And maybe I'm just a little bit uh, nostalgic. Maybe I'm a romantic, I don't know. But I think that there's something quite intriguing and quite attractive about uh, being able to send and copy Morse code. And uh, even, even a lot of the diehard digital guys I'm starting to hear them in CW contests. And yet I know that they're using their keyboards to send CW, but we all know that nothing copies Morse code like the brain. And if you're trying to copy Morse code with a computer, you're going to find it a pretty disappointing experience. So I think that, um, you know, for a lot of people, um, there is still a very strong interest in Morse code. It's a matter of making that, that step from um, being intrigued with it uh, to actually sitting down and, um, and learning it. And hopefully I can 
um, maybe provide a little bit of motivation um, for even one or two of you to, to make that leap. Um, of course, the other, uh, the other attractive elements of Morse code are, of course, it's the easiest mode to transmit. Um, all of the kits that you can buy, which are, which are very, very cheap and constructing them is very cheap. Um, Morse code is fun. Um, you can always improve. And um, I mean, I've been um, using Morse code actively for 37 years. And I've got friends that have been using Morse code for, you know, 50 plus years. Um, and we all agree that there's always room for improvement. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's just one of those skills, I suppose, like so many, um, that you never really master it and there's always something new to learn. And of course, those of us that like going camping in our caravans, we can stay up really late and we can use Morse code while the wife is sleeping. Whack on the headphones, use a paddle, don't use a key, and uh, you can stay up all night. QRP, and I've got a little anecdotal story about that a little further along, contesting. In fact, just about any interest that you have in radio can be augmented with Morse code, whether it's EME, HF, VHF, UHF, SHF, anything. Um, so um, I'm a big fan of, of Morse code. A few personal experiences, I hope just to perhaps whet your appetite. Norfolk Island 2013, um, I didn't have time to put any photos up in this presentation. Um, many of you might know Luke, VK3HJ, um, a very, very active CW operator. And he has a very, very impressive station up there in Benlock in central Victoria. Um, Brenton, VK3CBV and myself were operating from a cliff top on the north west corner of Norfolk Island. We'd been operating with a little KX3 on about 10 watts on 17 metres, um, working, working the world and having a great time. We had a 40 metre dipole up in the air. Um, so we were probably about 130 metres above sea level, 20 metres back from the Pacific Ocean. Um, and the antenna was you know, perfect really. So you can imagine we had a, a beautiful outlook looking out over the Pacific, um, wonderful for RF takeoff and we were working pileups. And as we do, we typically head down to this little cliff top at about 5 p.m. And at about 6 p.m. when it starts getting dark, we pack up and head back to the house for dinner, um, a beer and to then get on air or get back on air. It was starting to get cold. And Luke said, um, this is getting cold, let's pack up and go back to the house and have dinner. And Brenton and I looked at him and we said, well, the pile up is huge. We can't just walk away from the pile up. Uh, so Brenton said, um, let's wind the power back and everyone will think conditions are fading. So I wound the power back from 10 watts to five watts and the pile up didn't go away. And they kept giving us 599, but they give us 599 anyway. So after another three or four QSOs, we wound the power back again to two and a half watts. And the pileup didn't go away. It was still busy and we were still working them. And they were still giving us 599. So I wound the power back to one watt. And they started giving us a 569, a 579, but they weren't going away. We went to half a watt, pile up didn't go away. I went down to 100 milliwatts, 0.1 of a watt, and the pile up started decreasing. We said that there was heavy QSB and signals were fading. I worked another six or seven stations from Asiatic Russia, Japan, and North America with 100 milliwatts on 17 meters admittedly a perfect location, 120 metres above uh, sea level and about 20 metres back from the Pacific Ocean. That, uh, that afternoon will, will live long in my mind and it was a lot of fun and also illustrated just how easy it is to have contacts with Morse code with extremely low power. Another story on de-expeditions, VK9 LA, Lord Howe Island in 2009. I was thrown in front of the radio with a very, very experienced American operator. And we had a, an adapter on the phone switch. And both had headphones on so we could listen to the same pilot. 
And that was my way of, of having someone much more experienced than me um, help me command the pileup and get to understand how pileups work. The very interesting thing for me was at the time I was probably about uh, 40 and he would have been late 60s, maybe 70. Um, the bandpass filter was set to about 400 hertz. We were both hearing different signals because of our own internal band passes and the, the tones we were hearing. Um, so I was hearing a, a one station and I was writing down that call sign and he was looking at me like I was from another planet saying, I can't hear that. And he was writing down a different call sign. So, you know, once again, a part of the fascination of, of operating Morse code and coming to terms with it. The other um, passion I've sort of developed over the years is collecting old Morse code keys. Um, you can see that. This is the one I wanted to show you first. And in particular, can you see that? That's the brand maker's mark on the um, on the key. And I didn't get to research this until I got home. I was working in Stockholm and I was at the old part of Stockholm called the Old Town. I went into a um, antique store and I found this old key. And what you may not have seen was it's made by Lindholm and Wikström. And they are the two gentlemen that went on to form the Ericsson Communications Company in the early 20th century. A little bit of Googling um, revealed that this is um, what's known as a Swedish pump key. And it was probably built somewhere between 1897 and 1902. Um, and it's in original condition. You can see it's, it's a bit worn there. You can probably do a bit of the reconditioning. But um, that's probably the oldest key I've been able to find. Um, the exact same key, but somewhat newer. The brass is in beautiful condition. But that's exactly the same key, um, probably from the 1920s, 1930s. And they are both really, really nice to use too, by the way. The last one, this is a French key. Um, you can't see the maker's mark on there, I don't think. Well, you can, but you can't, probably can't read it. Um, but that, um, sorry, I can't read it in this light, but it's stamped Paris and the street address of the company that made it. And on the back, um, that it was 1913. Um, so that's another, a fairly old key, which is also very nice to use, but very clearly a different design. Um, so that's um, that's just another little part of, um, at least for me, the hobby of um, Morse code and uh, collecting and researching uh, old Morse code keys. Right, I mean, what's, what do you do with Morse code? You don't do anything different than you do um, talking on sideband or FM or digital modes. You contest, your DX, your rag chew. And interestingly enough, they all require different skills. And I think that's something that's quite important when you're thinking about learning Morse code. Having a rag chew with someone at 20 words a minute is completely different to going in a contest at 20 words a minute. Um, once you know your call sign, 20 words a minute isn't that hard because all you have to do is listen to the other station two or three times, get his call sign, and then you once you hear him call you, you know your call sign. Um, so it's relatively easy if your interest is contesting or DXing um, to become proficient because all you really need to know is your call sign, the numbers for uh, exchanging signal reports, um, and a few other characters, and of course the Q code. So if it, it's a great way of building up confidence um, once you've learnt the basics of Morse code is contesting and simply chasing DX. Um, rag chewing really does require a different set of skills because one of the roadblocks um, I've found and I think many people find in Morse code is you miss one character. You miss that one character 
and then all of a sudden you've missed the word and before you know it you've missed four or five words and you're cursing yourself um, and that's one of the biggest challenges with rag chewing if you miss a character you need to just put it out of your mind and move on and when you think about a lot of the way we rag chew to one another the way i'm talking to you now you may well be missing some of the words i'm saying your mind might drip, drift off, but you're still following the gist of what I'm saying. And you can do the same with Morse code. For example, if someone is saying to me, the weather is cloudy, uh, it'll be T-H-E, the, W-X for weather, is. Now, straight away, I know they're gonna say to me, it's, well, the weather is, just as if you were talking to me, the weather is sunny, cloudy, raining, windy, or fine. So I'm starting to set myself up for one of those words. And I'm probably 95% confident that it's gonna be one of those words. So as soon as they send CL, I know it's gonna be cloudy. As soon as they send SU, I know it's gonna be sunny. So conversational Morse code, um, by its very nature, is much more relaxed. Um, so, you know, that leads on to the next point that, um, you know, with Morse code, you're always improving your skills. Uh, sending is the same. Uh, it's a little bit like having a game of tennis. If you go out and have a game of tennis, you don't walk on and start with a serve straight away into the match. You have a bit of a warm up. And it's very much the same with Morse code. Um, you should always have a bit of a warm up with your paddle, send some pentagrams. Um, pentagram is a short sentence or a long sentence that has every letter of the alphabet in it. And there is, I'll show you shortly some websites that have got great references. But sending a pentagram or two before you start sending is a great way to warm, warm yourself up and get the rhythm going um, in your Morse code sending. The same goes for receiving. Uh, typically, I'll always turn on the radio, uh, spin the dial, and I'll find a QSO that's going on and I'll have a listen to it. Just to start to get the brain into Morse code mode. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier about um, the, um, the mental break um, that you get uh, both in trying to, you, you miss a character, you miss a word, how do you force yourself to move on? And for a lot of people, um, there's a barrier. You get to about 16 to 18 words a minute. I don't know what you found, Dave, but you get you get to a certain speed and no matter what you do, you can't go faster. So in 2020, I enrolled in CW Ops, CW Academy. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of slides, but um, it, it is a fantastic program and highly recommended. All right, um, moving along. You make the decision you want to give this a go. Um, you want to have a bite of the cherry and learn the code. Where do you start? I think the first thing you must do is you must decide how committed you are. I've tried running a, a, a few Morse code classes over the years and it's been quite uh, deflating because you get to the third or fourth week. You started off with 10 or 12 people. By the third or fourth week, you're down to three or four. Uh, and you do the exercises for the day and two of the three people can't copy you ask them to send and it sounds like i don't know the dog got upset and you ask what happened and well i don't know you know um the cat got hit by a car i got called into the office there is every excuse under the sun Yet these people, they still get time to post about 50 things on Facebook. Um, they still uh, spend 20 minutes having their morning coffee. So the only thing that I'll say is you must decide how committed you are. And if your commitment isn't 90 to 100% for an eight week period, you're gonna really struggle to learn the code and you'll get disheartened and you'll say, I give up, it's too hard. I know those are harsh words, but um, I've seen it happen many, many times. Um, the other thing you need to decide is if you're gonna learn online at your own pace and essentially on your own, which is hard work. 
unless you're very disciplined and you feel confident that you can learn something on your own without a team environment? Or do you want to be part of a structured learning course, which for many of us is a, a better approach? Um, method and speed. Um, I think in the 21st century, you should be saying to yourself, I'm going to learn at 18 words a minute, because if you learn at five words a minute, it's agonizing. And that's what most of us did, well, um, 37 years ago for me. And it was a real barrier to me getting past 20 words a minute. Because what's happening when you're learning Morse code at five or even 10 words a minute is you are hearing an A, which is dit da, and you're taking the dit da to an internal lookup table in your brain. And you're, oh, where's dit da? Oh, there's dit da. Dit da is an A. A da dit dit dit. Oh, what's a da dit dit dit? It's a B. What you want to do from day one is you just want to hear the sound dit da dit da dit da, and learn that is it is an A. You don't want to go to a lookup table. And I wish I'd known that 37 years ago. So increase the spacing between your characters, but learn each character at least at 18 words a minute, if not 20. And then very, very quickly, you'll find that you'll be able to have conversations at 15 words a minute with extra spacing between the words. Um, I've, I've noted down there, crawl, walk, run. Um, so don't expect that in two, three weeks, you're gonna be ready to have a contact. Um, you need to start off learning the characters and the letters and the few um, punctuation marks. There's only three or four of them. Um, and you need to master those at a character speed that you've decided, whether it's 15, 18 or 20. I recommend 18 or 20 as a starting point. And then have big spaces. When do you have your first QSO? We've been having a discussion on that on one of the FISTS online forums recently. A fellow has mastered everything. He's doing great online and he wants to get on air and is he ready? Um, he's at, I think he said he's at 15 words a minute characters and seven or eight words a minute effective um, speed. Well, once again, those of us who got our licenses, you know, pre-2004, you remember that ACMA or what was it, DOC back then, Department of Communications, they issued you with a certificate of proficiency at five words a minute. I mean, that's completely painful, but you had a certificate of proficiency. So you went and got on the air and you had QSOs at I can't believe it, but we did it at five words a minute. Um, so if you've got your character speed, what I'm trying to say here, if you've got your character speed at 15 or 18 words a minute, but your effective word speed is five, six, seven words a minute, you're more than ready to get on air. Um, what you might need is some support. And this is where Fist Down Under comes in or CW Ops. At Fist Down Under, we have three or four members who are more than happy to give you a telephone number. You can phone them and say, hello, Chris, are you free at 6 p.m. for my very first QSO on 40 metres? And we'll be there. And we can even leave the telephone line open so that we can have a chat as we're going. Because I think once you've had that first three or four QSOs, your confidence will increase and uh, you'll be into it. All right, um, we're nearly to the end. Um, as I've already said, forget the old ways. Um, they're outdated. Um, various psychologists and other professionals have long since proven that those old five and 10 word a minute methods are not effective. Um, the common method now is called the Farnsworth method, which is what I've just described. So you, you learn the code at a fast character speed, but you increase the space between the letters and the words. I might just ask you, David, if you could send the letter V three times at 10 words a minute. So, right, there you go. So, so that's 10 words a minute and it's, you know, it's a bit slow. 
Could you do the same at 20 words a minute, please, Dave? There you go. There's much more of a rhythm and a cadence. I, I hope that came through. I'm, unfortunately, my audio to PC isn't working tonight because that was going to be a large part of the presentation, illustrating how much more effective it is to learn Morse code with a faster character speed, but increasing the gaps between each character. Um, this is what all of the experienced um, Morse code trainers are promoting and encouraging. Um, and I find myself with some of the tools I'll talk about shortly, um, I speed them up even to, to 25, 30 words a minute, but I increase the character spacing. And after just 10 minutes of doing that, and maybe only copying 50% of what's being sent, I can come back to 20 words a minute, and 20 words a minute all of a sudden sounds very slow, which I, I know sounds a little bit um, self-confident saying that, but it's, it's a little bit like going from 10 words a minute to five words a minute. Um, one of the things I've found, and I suppose any of you that have done any sort of intensive training um, would, would tend to agree, and that is if you immerse yourself in what you're trying to learn, be it a new language, um, Morse code, um, anything else, if you immerse yourself in it for six or eight weeks, um, your learning becomes far more effective um, you tend to enjoy it more. You don't have the distractions of other things going on. And you really do progress very, very quickly. And I've certainly found this to be the case with Morse code. As I mentioned earlier and a little bit further down, CW Academy. Can't recommend it highly enough. It goes for eight weeks. There are two uh, weekly uh, class sessions which are run over Zoom. There is mandatory homework. And I missed one of my classes. And the very next morning, my American, um, they call them advisors, my American advisor phoned me to say, are you okay, Chris? And I said, yes, Phil, I'm fine, thank you. How are you and why are you phoning? We missed you at class last night. And I said, oh yeah, um, a tree came down over the driveway and I had to saw it up. And he said, why? You weren't going to be going anywhere. You were going to be in your Morse code class. And he said, um, we're very, very strict. He said, I have never had anyone drop out of my class. And one of the reasons for dropping out is you don't attend class. So the message got through um, fairly clear. And after that, I was at every class. And other little things. Um, they say, how did everyone go this week? And one week I said, oh, I've, I've been listening to, I found a YouTube channel with the 100 most common English words in Morse code at 28 words a minute. And I thought, I'll listen to that in the car while I'm driving and that'll help me. And I said, oh, I've been doing this. And he said, what about the homework? Oh, I didn't do the homework because I've been doing this. And his response, and he was quite right, was we've been running this course for quite some years. We've put thousands of students through it. Pretty much everyone who follows the course passes. So what is that telling you about the course material? That it works. So I put my other little ideas to one side um, and I went back to the agreed curriculum. And um, as with the other five guys in my class, we were all able to send and receive conversational Morse code at 25 words a minute at the end of the eight week class. So it was a very, very successful class from my perspective. The commitment from CW Ops was outstanding and the methods they used um, really made it easy and fun. Um, so if anyone is interested in that, um, please feel free to contact me and I'm happy to, to talk more about that. Um, we don't use tapes anymore, obviously. Um, everything is on the computer. Um, this little thing, it's called a Morserino. I know it's not gonna come up well on the screen here. But it's a little training aid. And other than there being a little Arduino computer in there and some fairly cool software, um, it's a complete <coughs> A to Z 
training aid if you want to learn Morse code. So it's got programs in there to take you through learning A to Z, uh, zero to nine, and the punctuation marks using the Farnsworth method, which is what I described earlier. It's got some other fantastic little programs in there. There's um, one where it sends you some Morse code, either call signs or English words or even sentences, and then you have to send it back using the little paddle here. And if you send back correctly, it gives a little beep and it says correct and it moves on to the next test. If you get it wrong, it's a much lower tone beep and it gives, it sends it to you again and you get another opportunity. It does that three times. Fantastic little tool for learning Morse code. So if you're one of those people that wants to work on your own, highly recommend it. Very good little tool. Um, this is why I wanted to come along to the club. I wanted to be able to demonstrate these things in, in person. Um, then there's a myriad of, com of computer programs. Um, I won't go through them all here. Anyone that's interested, let me know. Um, there's a couple of websites I'll refer you to. Um, learning CW online, lcwo.info or .org, I'm not sure. At Fist Down Under, we don't do any formal training. Um, we're happy to refer people to CW Ops or, LCW, or LCWO. Which leads me on now to the resources. Um, here in VK, as I've already mentioned, we have fists down under. We've got uh, 260 something members across Australia and New Zealand, about 198 in Australia, and the other 60 or so are in New Zealand um, with a couple of Oceania members. Um, we've found through the last, particularly five or six years, I guess, the things that seem to be the most successful for helping people. Um, Surprisingly, perhaps, perhaps not. Discourse. Um, Discourse is a little app that you pop on your phone and it's a messaging app. Um, not unlike um, Facebook Messenger. So you set, we, we have set up a group called Fist Down Under. People join that group and then you just send little messages and everyone in the group gets them. So I might be outside gardening and my phone goes beep, 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 beep and I have a look and it might have been David VK3RU saying, I'm putting out a CQ on 7028 if anyone's about. So I'll immediately drop the shovel and uh, dash inside and go up on 7028 and I'll hear David calling and I'll go back and we'll have a QSO. Um, discourse is, I'm just trying to find it here. Discord rather, not discourse, discord. So here we are. I don't know if this is going to come up, it's not. but you can see there, it's just messages. And it's proven, I was quite surprised, we've now got about 59 members on Discord. And pretty much every day someone comes up and says, I'm on such and such a frequency and someone else will come up and say, great, I'll see you there. Um, we also have, as I've mentioned already, three or four experienced members who are happy to be buddies. So if you're looking for someone to help you out on a one-on-one, -on -one, um, they are there. Um, we have our website, fdu.org.au. Uh, we have a quarterly magazine. Globally, I've mentioned CW Ops. They have a, a, an outstanding website. I can't recommend it highly enough. They've got some fantastic resources, both for learning and for reading. Um, they also have CW Buddies, a list of great tools to help you learn the code. I've mentioned CW Academy and a very, very good monthly magazine. Probably one of the benefits that CW Ops has over Fists Down Under is um, a lot more members, which means a lot more volunteers to help do stuff. Um, and they've got CW Academy and the resources to do that. Um, I think they've got about 40 or 50 advisors or teachers now. And they're putting about 800 to 1000 students a year through CW Academy, which is, um, it's absolutely fantastic, it really is. All right, I'd hope to do a lot more practical stuff, but um, I couldn't be at the club rooms. And unfortunately, um, for whatever reason, the microphone's not picking up my CW.
All right, that sort of leads on to what David was talking about earlier. Is there enough interest for us to run a dedicated class? Um, otherwise, uh, of course, go along and enrol in CW Academy. I know that there's about four Australian operators who are either doing or have done CW Academy in the last six to 18 months. So um, it definitely works. Uh, they typically run it at um, a time of day for us in Australia that's about anywhere between 9am and 11am. So maybe not so good if you've got a day job, but for those of us who um, have got the mornings to ourselves, it's perfect. All right, that finishes up, I think, everything I wanted to say. But it's been a great presentation, um, something that intrigues me, um, and I trust it intrigues others um, here this evening. So thank you very much, Chris. If I could reach out and pass a banner to you, I would do so. <laughs> but the check's in the mail, so thank you. Oh, terrific. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for that. No, it's a and, pleasure. Um, that reminds me, I'm in Devitt for a couple of others too, but anyway, we need to deal that. I hope we've got enough in stock, John. Um, but um, yeah, so thanks, Chris. It's uh, it's always good to have um, on our own to uh, deliver to our own and um, an interesting subject for me, that's for sure. So thanks very much, Chris. Appreciate it very much.